So you're a libertarian, and you don't believe the propaganda about government awesomeness you were subjected to in fourth grade. You want real history and economics. Well, learn in your car from professors you can trust with Tom Woods's Liberty Classroom. And if you join through the Liberty Classroom link at scotthorton.org, we'll make a donation to support The Scott Horton Show. Liberty Classroom, the history and economics they didn't teach you. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. More than 3,000 interviews in the archives now at scotthorton.org. Drop by scotthorton.org. And uh, also uh, check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at slash Scott Horton Show. Okay, uh, our first guest today is Mel Freikberg. Uh, she writes for McClatchyDC.com, well, McClatchy Newspapers at McClatchyDC.com. And uh, right now, I believe, is reporting from the West Bank, correct? Hi, Mel, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much for having me. And am I right you're in uh, the West Bank right now, or on it? Yes, I am. I'm in Ramallah. In Ramallah, okay. Um, and then, uh, do I have it right that you've been to Libya lately, or you're talking with stringers there? Um, I'm talking with sources on the ground there and with friends that are there. Okay. And I know you were there, what, a, a few months back, right? I was there, yeah, I was there last year. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, so first of all, uh, before we even get into the kidnapping, can you tell us what you know about the uh, president of um, of Libya who was kidnapped for a short time a couple of weeks back there? Yes, he's the prime minister. Just oh, the prime minister. Prime minister. Yeah. Uh, Ali Zaydan saying that um, two members of the Libyan Congress were behind his kidnapping and a member of the um, counter-criminal agency was involved in the kidnapping as well. And when they actually kidnapped him, they took his phone away from him, and his phone was later discovered in the General National Congress building because the whole mystery behind his kidnapping of how they'd been able to get him in, in the Corinthia Hotel, which I visited, and for those kidnappers to get through the security um, was very strange that they'd managed to get through all that security, and apparently his actual security detail didn't try to stop the kidnapping because um, they understood it to be an official arrest, and he was actually held at the Interior Ministry. So that just goes to show how little security is in Libya and um, how much infighting there is between members of the government. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. I mean, was he actually, in a way, legally arrested for a crime and then he was set free, or that was just the glossing that they put on an attempted coup? No, no, no. It, 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 there's been some political dispute, and I mean, he's committed no crime, but these members of the Congress, that um, it was all unofficial, but they um, dissatisfied with his rule as Premier, and they sort of thought that he maybe had something to do with the um, the abduction of the that Al Qaeda suspect um, Anas Abu Libi, who was um, taken by the Navy SEAL team by the the, special, the U.S. Special Forces, mm-hmm. that was one issue that they were dissatisfied because the, these guys that um, from the Libyan government are suspected Islamist sympathizers, but also they're dissatisfied with with his rule. Uh, right. Well, so. I mean, how badly did that reflect on him uh, for the that Delta Force raid happening on his watch? Is it clear, do you think, uh, over there that he had given the Americans permission to do it? I think that's at least what the Americans yeah. claimed, right? Um, they say that um, the Libyan government was aware of what was happening. The Libyan government denies it. Rumors are that um, they knew, the Libyan government knew about it, but... Um, they would pretend that they didn't know about it, and then they would protest very loudly after it happened, so as for for domestic consumption that they hadn't, that they didn't know about it. That's that's what the rumours are. Mm-hmm. But I mean, just the fact that he was able to get through all that security, because I mean, I've been to the Corinthia Hotel, 
And I mean, there's like, there's police cars patrolling the, the hotel. Before you can even get into the hotel, there's a big, there's a big, you know, you have to go through all this, these metal detectors. There's security guards inside the hotel. Even getting into the parking lot, there's a military checkpoint there. And there's military police three minutes away. So, you know, the, the, just the way that they were able to get through all this and nothing happened, it, it was very suspicious. Um, the two members of, of Congress have denied that, that they were involved in it, but the member from the counter-criminal um, agency, he said, yes, he was involved, and, and, he's, and he's very proud of it. So, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of um, strange things happening in Libya. Mm. And just to clarify for the audience, uh, this is not the al Libby that uh, was tortured into pointing at, pointing the finger at Saddam Hussein for cooperating with al-Qaeda. And it's not the al-Libi that they killed in Pakistan in June 2012 that was the the uh, reason behind the attack on the Benghazi consulate uh, back in September 11, 2012. This would be a third and altogether separate uh, al-Libi. And I believe those first two were brothers, supposedly. But this is an entirely different character accused in... Uh, I think, as you said, the Africa embassy bombings in 1998. Yeah. But then they yeah. brought him, they, they kidnapped him and kept him on a on a ship at sea for a little while, apparently kind of black hole lawless territory, but then they brought him back to New York, where I guess he'd already been indicted, and now they're going to put him on trial. So that's pretty good, right? Instead of taking him to Morocco to be tortured or Guantanamo Bay to be held forever? Well, the thing is, um, according to him... Um he had actually, and according to his family, he'd actually left Al Qaeda in ninety six or was it ninety five, and he'd actually asked for political asylum in Britain, which he had received. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, they, he's like quite an old fish, and right. so that he, they're saying that he probably didn't have anything to do with anything after that. But I'm not sure. Well, I don't mean to be too cynical, but I wonder if the Americans are just trying to provoke a reaction and. He was a good target for that. Poss- possibly. I, mean, I don't see know. A, a big build up in, in Italy, and they're saying, well, we got problems to solve here. I don't, I'm sorry. I, you're a straight reporter. I'm not trying to lead you down into uh, rabbit hole territory here. Um, uh, so uh, let's go to what life is like in Tripoli and in Benghazi and in the rest of Libya right now. Is it just Mad Max over there, or does the government have a. Is there a relative calm? Well, Benghazi is an absolute mess. Um, they've had over 100 um, military and judicial officials um, assassinated since the overthrow of Gaddafi. Um, every week, it's practically almost every day, actually, there's another military or judicial official um, assassinated. And they're not sure, if, you know, they, they've said that they, somebody has a list of uh, of, of all these names of people that they want to assassinate. And there's now seems to be a war between members of... It's the, it seems that there's different militias that are behind the assassinations, and it's divided between those that are supporting... The, those are the, that are Islamist-leaning militia leaders and the others who are um, against the Islamists. Um, the, the military police, the head of the military police was killed a couple of days ago, and then people, militiamen who were supporting him, then went and attacked um, the leader of some of the of the Libya Shield movement, and so these two sides have been trying to kill the different leaders, and there doesn't seem to be anybody who's able to stop these assassinations, and the different foreign embassies or consulates that have been attacked in Benghazi. Um, the Swedish one was attacked a couple of weeks ago with a, with a bomb. Mm-hmm. Um, then the Maltese um, consul was warned that his life was in danger, so he left um, Benghazi and he left Libya. And of course the French consul was attacked um, several months ago as well. So Benghazi is really out of control. Um, there's stuff happening in Tripoli as well, but it's not as serious as Benghazi. Mm-hmm. Well, and don't get me wrong, it's not like uh, building a state is the definition of peace to me or anything, but it's an indication that, um, you know, there's uh, uh, a lack of, of war going on. I mean, if there's militias fighting each other over, you know, local spoils, I guess that's kind of one thing, but if there's 
you know, if it breaks out into some kind of sectarian war or tribal war, that is a whole other level of violence. And I don't think you're saying we're there, right? Well, these different tribes are supporting different um, leaders. There's different tribes that are supporting um, some of the Islamists and different tribes that are supporting some of the leaders, the, the militia leaders who are against the Islamists. I mean, Ali Zaydan himself said, Libya is not a state, a functioning state in, in the sense of, of the word. He himself has said that. So I don't know what's going to happen. It just, just seems endless in Libya. Well, you know, I was talking with Patrick Coburn the other day, and he was remarking about the media and the the professional political class, all the pundits and whatever who got us into this thing, and how remarkable it is that they can just completely ignore it. And then I was explaining how my fear is they'll start paying attention to it, and they'll say that, you know what, I mean, they don't even need a boogeyman as bad as Gaddafi. They might just point at general chaos and say that only we can help and go in there and start trying to make it better, which, of course, would just make it worse, but that's okay, then there's just more to do. I think NATO has said uh, recently that they're going to help the Libyans with security, so I don't know how that'll work out. It just points very badly for what will happen in Syria when you see what a mess Libya is, um, and Syria's going to be an even bigger mess, so, mm -hmm. you know, with the Americans getting involved there. Well, now, when we hear about the different... Uh, Islamist militias in Libya, are they uh, kind of going crazy like Saudis and cutting people's hands off and and trying to, um, you know, uh, we saw, for example, Al-Qaeda in Iraq a lot of times would try to enforce, uh, you know, centuries old, real backwards ways on people, that kind of thing. Are we seeing that sort of extremism or just they're fighting over power? No, but what they have been doing is the assassinations and the bombings. They haven't been cutting hands off per se. Mm. But don't forget, when I was in Tripoli, the Clippers were behind a lot of attacks on Sufi shrines where they would just blow up these different, you know, these centuries-old, very beautiful buildings with, you know, books going back centuries from Sufi scholars, and they were sort of destroying graveyards, um, shrines, etc. So, and there were cases where they were actually going around enforcing women to cover their hair. And I think it was just a couple, of, was it today or yesterday, a, 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 a woman's beautician shop in Benghazi was attacked. Hmm. They've had a couple of cases of it, like in, in Gaza, where sol salons and beautician shops are um, attacked by Islamists because they see them as sort of corrupt and Western. But I'm not aware as of chopping of hands, um, from what I've heard now, heard about that. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mean to imply that I had read that anywhere either. I just, uh, I wonder about, you know, because obviously in Syria and in Iraq, we've got uh, some some reports of uh, some pretty extreme things. You know, the banning of smoking and and just, you know, pretty totalitarian ways. And in fact, really the kind of things that, turn the locals against them pretty fast, as we saw in Iraq. They they overreached really quickly as far as their authority over the Sunni population of Iraq, and, and they paid for it, too. Yeah. Well, that's what's one of the problems in Benghazi, is that the um, that there are a lot of Islamists there, but also the general population is against the ins Islamists, as we saw, you know, when Chris Stevens was killed. It was, you know, a big protest against mm -hmm. uh, against the killing. So the militia, that's also an element with the militias and probably playing into the, the assassinations that are going on with, as I said, over 100 um, military and judicial assassinators, leaders assassinated. Mm -hmm. And now, I guess uh, I'm curious, can you describe at all, do you know, um, how deeply integrated... Uh, groups like Ansar al-Sharia and the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group and others are into the actual government in Tripoli? Because I remember, and this could be wrong, but there were at least some reports from the attack on the oil facility in Algeria that the clothing and the weaponry that the, uh, you know, quote-unquote terrorists had there came from the Libyan government. I, I, I know that there are definitely members that are sympathetic to the Islamists, but a lot of the weapons that are coming from Libya and are flooding the different areas, like Mali, um, they, I mean, they're even coming into Egypt and they get, they're reaching Gaza as well, are not officially from the Libyan government. Although um, 
there, there are members, as I say, of the government that are sympathetic. A lot of them is just, a lot of the weapons is just, are, are very illegal. Right. Although I also seem to remember um, the Libyan government is get, giving a lot of money to, to, the Syrian, um, to the Syrian rebels. They were giving a huge amount of money to the Syrian rebels. So it's so, I mean, to know exactly who's doing what there, it's just, just, it's just very unclear. Mm. And then, um, do you know anything of the fate of the blacks? Because, um, and I mean, I don't mean that in the politically correct way, the blacks, but I mean the blacks of Libya, because apparently uh, the war was fought for the Libyan branch of the Ku Klux Klan, and they had gone, at least back in 2011, we heard some horror stories about what was happening to darker-skinned Africans in Libya, yes. and then the journalism on that subject has just completely fallen off. Um, I, I, it was, I know when I, I was there, I was visiting um, some Tawaragans who come from that city of, of you know, black-skinned Libyans who allegedly were, you know, fighting with Gaddafi, and one doesn't know whether they were pressured into fighting with Gaddafi or whether they generally sympathized with him, but that town of Tawarga was just totally um, destroyed and ethnically cleansed of Tawargans, and they had subsequently fed, fled to um, refugee camps in Tripoli and elsewhere. And a lot of them, when I went to the refugee camps there, they were actually scared to walk in the, to leave the, the refugee camps and w go around Tripoli because they would be, they would be picked up by these different militias. There was a very, very strong anti- um, black African sentiment from certain sections of the um, of, of of the of the revolutionaries in that. But while I was in Tripoli as well, I also saw um, a lot of the um, militia guys themselves were actually dark skinned um, 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 Libyans, and you know I would basically see you know dark skinned Libyans in the street um, married to lighter skinned Libyans. Again, it was just from it, it's not correct to say all Libyans were against them, but there was certainly yeah. a section who, especially from Misrata, because there was a lot of problems between Misrata and Tawerga, and I know the Misrata militias were very um, instrumental in a lot of the atrocities carried out against darker-skinned Libyans. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you think it's sort of died down since then, at least. It, does, it hasn't made the news a lot since then, and I haven't heard the human rights organizations saying a lot about it. So maybe there has been some improvement, or maybe people have just, I don't know, got so tired of Libya being such a mess, and there's so much so much trouble going on there, and they're now focusing on what's going on with Syria. So I'm not 100% certain. Right. Yeah, on to the next war, and on to the next one. All right. Well, and speaking of which, let's talk about what's going on in the Sinai. You got some great journalism about uh, Egypt's uh, renewed military dictatorships crackdown there. Yeah, they um the the um it's the largest ground offensive um in the Sinai. Um, it, the, the largest Egyptian domestic offensive since the 1973 war with Egypt. The military is still carrying on with large-scale, you know, bombings and arrests. But exactly what is going on is hard to know because the Egyptian military is like cracking it down on foreign journalists. Foreign journalists are not allowed to go to the area, and even the Egyptian journalists are struggling to get in. So it's very, um, it's very difficult to know exactly what is going on, but human rights organizations say the stuff is leaking out is that the Egyptian military is carrying out... Um, some atrocities. They are indiscriminately targeting people on occasion. They've arrested hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, but as I say, exactly what is going on? Because some, you know, even some foreigners who've been caught in the area, and because they've had a laptop on them and a map on them, which is fairly normal stuff to have if you're a journalist, they've been arrested. So. The operations are, are continuing, but they're not stopping these people in the Sinai. These people in the Sinai are really, really angry, and they're carrying out more attacks against the Egyptian military. So that's another situation that doesn't seem that's going to be solved by force alone. And now, so what is it with them? That just happens to be a stronghold of uh, strong Muslim Brotherhood support, or...? 
Someone they, else. They are they are strong Muslim Brotherhood supporters because the under the not all of them, but what has to happen is that the Egyptian current Egyptian government, a military installed in government, has alienated a lot of the tribes in the Sinai. When Mubarak was in power, Hosni Mubarak, um, he um, withheld a lot of privileges and power from the Sinai people. He helped they didn't they weren't politically involved and they were not get they were also very deprived economically. So they began they were against the um Hosni Mubarak's regime and they became smuggling for economic reasons and they also felt very politically cut off from Cairo. And of course M- 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 Mubarak's security forces was very brutal against the people in the Sinai and that alienated them even more. When Mursi got into power, he was more sympathetic to their situation, and because they were more, they, a lot of them were Islamists, they, they had a better situation. They were not as alienated, and there wasn't the degree of political persecution that there was under Mubarak and that, that there is currently under the present government. And um, now that the... So when he was overthrown, they were very angry about it, as the Muslim Brotherhood supporters in the rest of the country. And now that the military is cracking down on them again, and they are a lot of them are of extreme Islamists as well, they are now fighting each other again. And as I say, that's a situation that's just really difficult to control because the Sinai is so open, it's so large, and it's so poor. And to just control that area completely, the Egyptian military is going to have to have huge resources there on a permanent basis. Hmm. And, you know, speaking of which, is the support for the Muslim Brotherhood, is it very geographically centered? I mean, not just in the Sinai, but in other places in Egypt, is it more, you know the cities are the Democrats and out in the countries where the Republicans live sort of thing like it is in the States or, or, um, how does that work exactly? I mean, I know that they were the only ones prepared to win when it came to election time. Yeah, it's, um, kind of a breakdown because although there were a lot of supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo, a lot of them who are educated, they tend to get more of their supporters from the rural people who are less educated because, about 60% more of the Egyptian population is illiterate. And um, in Upper East as well, there is strong support for the Muslim Brotherhood. So a large section of their supporters come from the more rural, um, illiterate, uneducated people. Although a lot of the leaders and the you know, the, the intellectual Cairo are also supporting the Brotherhood, but they're more, in, uh, they're more of a minority. Hmm. Well, so now that the uh, the dictatorship has overthrown and outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood and rounded up all its leaders and all of that kind of thing. Um, I mean, obviously, we talked about the Sinai and the unrest there, but uh, what about all those people in the countryside who were Muslim Brotherhood supporters? Are they just grinning and bearing it and back to the same old thing? Or is this... I mean, wouldn't it be horrible to see after a couple of years since the overthrow of Mubarak for this to now devolve into some kind of... Civil war. I mean, I don't guess the Muslim Brotherhood is very well armed, but it seems like. You know. um, well, the thing is that they're, they're arresting people all over the country. I mean, thousands and thousands of people have been arrested, so it's, it's not just happening in Cairo. And I mean, at the moment, it's a little bit quiet. I mean, in Cairo, there's been a, you know some protests by students at Al Azhar University, which is very pro Muslim Brotherhood. But it's kind of quiet at the moment. But I'm. The Muslim Brotherhood is not going to let the situation lie, and I think their, their motive for Randy is to, because what the Egyptian government now is trying to restore stability and say that the problems are over and the country is going to go back to normal, and the Muslim Brotherhood is not just going to let the situation lie, and I think they are trying to um, actually bring their supporters onto the street because they actually do use the clashes and the results. Um, as a kind of a weapon to, sh- you know, to show that they're being persecuted, which they are to a large degree, but also, you know, that people don't forget what has happened to Mercy, and uh, they, they they're using the victimhood of all these people that have been killed, the Brotherhood people that were killed by the, the military, and that they are using that as a as a as a way of keeping their their their, their story alive, and you know, not letting the situation lie. So they will try to, I think they, 
the leadership is a bit cynical in that way and that they will try to get their supporters in the street to provoke clashes. I mean, one can argue quite justifiably that they have every right to be angry and that what happened to Muslim was not right. But actually encouraging their supporters to go out into the streets and confront the military when they know what's going to happen is kind of cynical in a way. Yeah, well, people ought to be careful whose marching orders they follow when it comes to stuff like that, yeah. But uh, yeah. you can see why it makes sense from their point of view to to play it up for the cameras, you know? Uh, it's all they've yeah. got, right, is the idea of some kind of outside pressure there, I guess. I'm not, not sure if the Muslim Brotherhood is, because they were involved in the 80s in actual, you know, attacks on tourists and that. I'm not sure if they're going to go underground and take up arms again. That's another That's another aspect that has to be watched. It may yeah. happen, I don't know. Um, well, there has been, what, one big car bombing, right? And that had everybody biting their fingernails, like, oh, no, maybe now is the start of this, but... Yeah, but that, that wasn't by the Muslim Brotherhood, it was just by other groups. And, mm-hmm. and there's been, you know, there's been regular bombings in the Sinai against um, mm-hmm. military targets and, of course, some Christian targets as well. But that wasn't actually the Muslim Brotherhood. By the way, back to the Sinai for a second there. Uh, is there any truth to the idea that it's Al-Qaeda guys there? Because, of course, that's what the TV says, if they mention it at all. Uh, as far as I know, yes, there are Al Qaeda elements there. I mean, even in Gaza, there, there are some Al Qaeda elements. This is the whole thing um, with the Libyan war. There are Al Qaeda elements there, and in Mali, there are Al Qaeda elements, and they are getting arms from Islamists in Libya, and the huge amount of arms that are now going from Libya to surrounding neighboring countries, mm. you know, after Gaddafi's um, warehouse and warehouses and that were looted. There definitely is elements of Al-Qaeda in, in the Sinai. I mean, they actually fly the Al-Qaeda flag. and or Even if they're not directly linked to Al-Qaeda, they are groups with similar ideologies. Yeah, sworn allegiances. Well, so a few years ago, uh, in the Gaza Strip, Hamas went and had a big battle and killed a bunch of these guys and said, no way are we going to tolerate your presence in the Gaza Strip. What about that? Is that still happening? Um, they are still as Jaish or Sunni and Sunni al Islam. Those those groups are still there, but they're basically being kept under control by Hamas. They are, I mean, these groups are really, really radical because Hamas doesn't want another, you know, military Israeli military operation against them because these little groups tend to, um, they, you know, the Egyptians are saying and the Israelis are saying, and I think there's some. There's some truth in what they're saying, that these radical elements in Gaza are actually um, cooperating with the, with the radicals in, uh, in the Sinai as well. Mm. All right, well, I'm sorry that i got to stop you, but uh, thank you very much for your time on the show, Mel. I sure do All appreciate right. it. Good talk to you again. Okay, thanks. Everybody, that's Mel Freikberg. She writes for McClatchy Newspapers, McClatchyDC.com. They're syndicated all over the place. And you can find some stuff by her for uh, IPSnews.net, too. Hey, all Scott here. Man, I had a chance to have an essay published in the book Why Peace, edited by Mark Gutman, but I didn't understand what an opportunity it was. Boy, do I regret I didn't take it. This compendium of thoughts by the greatest anti-war writers and activists of our generation will be remembered and studied long into the future. You've got to get Why Peace. You've got to read Why Peace. It features articles by Harry Brown, Robert Naiman, Fred Bronfman, Dahlia Wasfi, Richard Cummings, Karen Gutowski, Butler Schaefer, Kathy Kelly, Robert Higgs, Anthony Gregory, and so many more. Why peace? Because war is the health of everything wrong with our society. Get why peace. Down at the bookshop or Amazon.com. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Oh man, I'm late. Sure hope I can make my flight. Stand there. Me? I am standing here. Come here. Okay. Hands up. Turn around. Oh, easy. Into the scanner. Ooh, what's this in your pants? Hey, slow down. It's just my... Hold it right there. Your wallet has tripped the metal detector. What's this? The bill of rights. That's right. It's just a harmless stainless steel business card-sized copy of the bill of rights from securityedition.com. There for exposing the TSA is a bunch of liberty-destroying goons who've never protected anyone from anything. Sir, now give me back my wallet and get out of my way. Got a plane to catch. Have a nice day. 
play a leading role in the security theater with the Bill of Rights Security Edition from SecurityEdition.com. It's the size of a business card, so it fits right in your wallet, and it's guaranteed to trip the metal detectors wherever the police state goes. That's SecurityEdition.com. And don't forget their great Fourth Amendment socks. Hey guys, I got his laptop. Fact. The new NSA data center in Utah requires 1.7 million gallons of water every single day to operate. Billions of Fourth Amendment violations need massive computers and the water to cool them. That water is being supplied by the state of Utah. Fact. There's absolutely nothing in the Constitution which requires your state to help the feds violate your rights. Our message to Utah? Turn it off. No water equals no NSA data center. Visit offnow.org. Hey, Al Scott here for MyHeroesThink.com. They sell beautiful 7-inch busts of libertarian heroes Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, and Harry Brown. I've got the Harry Brown one on the bookshelf now. Makes me smile every time it catches my eye. These finely crafted statues from MyHeroesThink.com make excellent decorations for your desktop at work, bookends for your shelves, or gifts for that special individualist in your life. They're also all available in colors now, too. Of course, gold, silver, or bronze. Coming soon, Hayek, Hazlitt, Carlin. Use promo code Scott Horton and save $5 at MyHeroesThink.com. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here to talk to you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State, The Cold War Origins of the Military-Industrial Complex and the Power Elite. In the book, Swanson explains what the revolution was, the rise of empire, and the permanent military economy, and all from a free market libertarian perspective. Jacob Hornberger, founder and president of the Future Freedom Foundation, says the book is absolutely awesome and that Swanson's perspectives on the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis are among the best I've read. The poll numbers say that people agree on one thing. It's that America is on the wrong track. In the war state, Swanson gets to the bottom of what's ailing our society. Empire, the permanent national security bureaucracy that runs it, and the mountain of debt that has enabled our descent down this dark road. The war state could well be the book that finally brings this reality to the level of mainstream consensus. America can be saved from its government and its arms dealers. First, get the facts. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. Available at your local bookseller and at Amazon.com. Or just click on the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org. <laughs> 